Hey guys, welcome to another week of the question and answer for the education portal. I've got quite a few questions to get through today, so I'm going to jump right into it. But before I start, be sure to let us know if you have any follow-up questions based on the answers we provide. Always happy to elaborate a little further if need be. So keep that in mind, guys. If you ask a question and we provide an answer, feel free to continue building on it. Now, the first question I have for today uh, is quite simply, I suffer to grow my legs, so could you please give me some advice? Now, this is, yes, yeah, some advice that I've had to give numerous times over my career. Um, you know, how, how do we maximize uh, growth in the legs? Uh, usually people who train um, on average, I'd say, you know, especially males on average would probably struggle to grow their legs more than their upper body. So definitely a common uh, area that you know, us coaches need to cover. And the first thing I would say is, are you training your legs with the same commitment as your upper body? Again, on average, most people, most males, and this question is from a male, probably put more effort into their upper body than they do their lower body. And, and all variables aside, I'm just speaking about pure hard work and consistent training over time. You know, are you getting your leg sessions in weekly? Are you working as hard as you can in those, in those leg sessions? Um, do you take the leg training as seriously as you do the upper body training? So that's, that's the first question I would ask to this individual. And, you know, you do have to kind of reflect on that because sometimes it's, it's really just a matter of putting in the same amount of effort, the same commitment, um, as you do with, with other muscle groups, um, you know, with, with the mirror muscles. So something to keep in mind there. But beyond that, if we do kind of unpackage the, the, exercise, the training variables and, and um, seek out certain things we can do with those variables to, to promote further growth in the lower body, the first thing I would say is exercise selection. Um, a lot of individuals trying to grow their legs will often utilize exercises like um, squats, you know, deadlifts, etc. And they're both, you know, doing me wrong, both great exercises. But some in, some some people just aren't built for these types of movements, especially for a squat. You know, a squat um, is an exercise that needs the is that relies on the quads right but it also relies on the glutes the erectors other muscle groups and if you're just doing a standard squat then yes you're going to get some great activation through the quads um but you're also going to get activation in in other muscle groups and, and same thing for, for your deadlifts so deadlifts will emphasize the hamstrings but they're also really hard on the glutes and the erectors so these types of exercises don't isolate those specific lower body uh, muscle groups that we want to grow very well. Um, and for hypertrophy, remember, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to find an exercise that can really stimulate the specific muscle we are trying to grow. So really, you know, if um, you, with exercise selection, sorry, you need to choose exercises that work for you. So if you can get into like a full range of motion squat, um, you know, knees forward, upright posture and get a really quad dominant squat, squat going, then that's great. Um, you know, use that exercise. And I guess what I'm trying to get at here is that you don't have to do those types of movements to, to really grow your legs. Like when you, when you're choosing exercises um, to, to, to grow any muscle group, really you should be looking at stability. Um, and with, with leg training, that's probably increasingly important um, because you the likelihood of being unstable in certain exercises is probably greater for lower body uh, movements. You know, if you think about just the nature of lower body exercises, squats, split squats, um, you know, deadlifts, et cetera. So we need to choose exercises that come with a large degree of stability. Um, ensuring those exercises also stimulate the local muscle tissue um, at, you know, to, to a great degree is, is important. And again, some exercises do it better than others, right? Um, range of motion as well. So again, if you're doing a squat and you're struggling to get that range of motion um, and you know, your technique's just a little off and again, you're just not built to, to squat, um, or it might just be a technique issue, then you know, choose, choose something else. And the exercise also needs to come with a, or at least shouldn't come with an excessive amount of fatigue. And that's where the deadlifts and squats may also compromise growth to some degree. I'm just saying, you know, they can be implemented. But what I'm trying to say here is that, you know, you need to choose your exercises wisely. You don't always have to choose those exercises when you're looking at 
hypertrophy uh, for your legs. So those four things are really important for exercise selection. Um, you know, a few quick exercises, you know, leg presses, hack squats, they're all great leg extensions. Um, and then if you look at the hamstrings, RDLs, you know, leg curls, various types of leg curls are good. And then if we kind of step forward from there, the execution is, is of utmost importance as well, like I've touched on. And then I guess the next variable would be how hard are you, are you working in those sets? Okay, so intensity of effort is that key determinant of, of mechanical tension you know, within a set. It's going to determine how much tension muscle fibers are experiencing. And the nature of leg training, uh, unfortunately, is probably probably undesirable from like an intensity of effort standpoint because leg training is really hard. The discomfort is undoubtedly higher than it would be for upper body training. And it's just harder to reach those those uh, repetitions that are really close to failure, which is so, so important for hypertrophy. Um, so something to keep in mind there, you know, there is this, this, this intricate difference between leg training and upper body training that does need to be considered. And one of those things is, one of the differences is just the, the degree of discomfort, um, which can compromise the, the response you get from each set. And, and then I guess the last one I can touch on for now, and I'll probably leave it there is, you know, volume, making sure you are doing enough volume. And this comes back to what I said earlier, making sure you're committing the same amount of effort to your, your leg training, which means you know, doing enough volume and essentially just not bitching out on your leg sessions. So I hope that's enough advice for now. Uh, I think I'll move on to the next question. If you have more specific questions about that topic, feel free to shoot them through. Um, the next one is, uh, why is it so difficult to find true macros for food? So different results depending on the app you use. And this is an interesting question. Um, the nature of macro tracking is essentially, um, I, think, I, think, I think answers this question. Like macro tracking is never going to be 100% accurate. It's always our best guess. Um, and there's always going to be this error margin when you're tracking food. And even when you look at the back of a food packet and you look at the nutrition label, there's always going to be an error margin, you know, in the V macros that that food packet states. Because remember that the numbers you see in that nutrition label, they're just the average across all the, all the different foods that have been produced, obviously by this specific company. But the amount of, of calories in that one you know, packet that you've kind of taken off the shelf might be a little bit off. They might be a little bit different. Okay, remember, the average doesn't represent each individual, um, each individual calorie um, value in this case, right? Just like the average of a population for whatever it is doesn't necessarily represent certain individuals. It's the same thing here with you know, fruit, essentially. There's always going to be this error margin um, and this discrepancy in calories between even the same, the same food. So something to keep in mind there. Uh, and what I recommend is just using certified database entries. So for example, I'll use calorie King sometimes uh, for, you know, simple foods because they are certified. And, you know, the one question I would ask as well here is, do you need to know the true macros to hundred percent? And in most cases, you probably don't. Uh, if you use, you know, if, if you're close enough with your, with your entry on MyFitnessPal or whatever app you're using, you know, if, if, if it's certified um, or if you've scanned the, the barcode and it's given you some values, you know, they're probably close enough. And if you always use that same entry for that specific food, then things are going to be consistent over time. And you have what we can just call intra measurement consistency. So, you know, measurement consistency within your own measurements. Um, independent of all the other, you know, measurements, um, all other measurements of, from, from other foods, right, of, of the same foods. So you're using that one measurement yourself. So something to keep in mind there. But like I said, um, it's always our best guess and it's never going to be 100% accurate. So we'll move on. The next one is what exercises would you put in a program of an obese beginner who comes to train under you? So great question. Um, definitely a bit of a struggle point, I'd say, for some personal trainers. You know, when they or coaches when they um, are confronted, you know, with an obese individual and their their new client, it's always a bit tricky at first. 
that what I will say, uh, you know, with experience, I think with these clients, whatever they enjoy and can execute appropriately with low injury risk should take precedence. Uh, so, you know, we can speak about optimal exercise selection all day long, um, optimal exercise selection for muscle growth and you know, strength gains. But in this case, we need to optimize exercise selection for the individual in front of us. Okay, so for this obese beginner in this case. And the exercises that will be used with this individual are going to be a lot different to the ones I, I stated earlier, for example, when I was speaking about optimizing leg um, hypertrophy, lower body hypertrophy. There might be some similarities, but there's definitely going to be differences as well. So, you know, instead of listing exercises, I might just provide some considerations. And the first one is uh, picking exercises that come with low forces. So what I mean by this is uh, you wouldn't want to be prescribing things like jump, jump squats um, because they put a large amount of force through the connective tissue. And that's what I'm trying to get at here. So, so exercises that don't stress the connective tissue out as much um, and, you know, jump squats for an obese beginner probably aren't a good idea um, and probably isn't a good idea from a joint health perspective. So something to keep in mind, making sure you choose exercises that put the individual in a comfortable position. Um, you wouldn't want to make them uh, do specific exercises where they really need to stretch out or it's just uncomfortable. And, you know, they're thinking more about the position that they're in throughout the set as opposed to the set itself and as opposed to moving the weight as they should be. And also limiting range of motion if, if necessary. Um, you know, if, a, if the individual can't squat all the way down, you know, you, you really do have to kind of disregard everything I said earlier about range of motion um, for lower body hypertrophy. Um, in this case, you know, putting a box behind them and getting to do a limited range of motion squat is probably going to be in, you know, your best interest and also the clients. And I guess to, to kind of uh, build on that, your training probably needs to have somewhat of a functional focus. Um, I don't really like using that term too much, but yeah, that's just the reality of it. Like these individuals, they're in this to you know, lose weight, feel healthier, be healthier, feel better. Um, you know, they probably all have some sort of pain. You know, fo focus on that. Try to try to build on that. Build strength in certain areas that may alleviate that pain. For example, they have back pain. You know, most of these individuals might have some sort of back pain. You know, focus on addressing that um, and using that as a measure of progress. Um, you know, most of these individuals want to be more mobile. They want to move better. They want to be able to get up off a chair with without pain, etc. So, so something to keep in mind there. Um, again, this is completely like you know. Um, Def contrasting, you know, if we we're completely contrasting um, to the hypertrophy style of, of, of training. Um, and also, I guess the, the, the last thing I'll add is you probably want to choose exercises that come with a low aerobic demand. Um, obviously, these individuals will have cardiovascular limitations to some extent, and you probably want to limit the use of supersets, trisets, you know, high intensity work. Obviously, that can be implemented, but just have to be smart about the way you go about implementing it. Um, so, so something to keep in mind there because the last thing you want is their aerobic capacity greatly limiting the quality of their sessions um, and, and you know the, the sets themselves. And you don't want a client to feel like they're just huffing and puffing when really they're just doing resistance training. Um, and at the end of the day, for these guys, like if you know if they're obese, they probably have some sort of issue. Um, from a like a clearing glucose perspective, uh, so they, they may have diabetes. You know, that's, that's probably quite common. And at the end of the day, resistance training is so so important for you know cl uh, increasing an individual's ability ability to clear glucose from the bloodstream um, and reduce blood sugar levels, blood glucose levels. And really, all we need to do there is get the muscles contracting. So if you if you you know consider all the factors that I've just laid out, um, and you piece together a program that gets the the client moving, uh, gets their muscles contracting, then they're probably going to reap the benefits of resistance training um, because there is this insulin independent pathway of glucose clearance that can be um, activated through muscle contraction alone. Okay, so that's independent of of exercises. 
So yeah, hope that all makes sense. Um, again, I think sometimes providing considerations like that are more important than just listing exercises and not really teaching you anything. So take that yeah, for what it is and hopefully that is applicable and practical. So the next question was actually asked by Sam. Uh, he thought it would be insightful to teach everyone about why he rests longer than I do when we train. So he asked, um, do large muscles take longer to recover than smaller ones? And quite simply, the answer to that question is yes. So that is why Sam uh, takes longer rest periods than I do when we train. So a few reasons why this, this, this occurs. Um, and the first thing I'll say is that all else being equal, the amount of tension a muscle experiences will increase per unit of cross-sectional area. Okay, so the larger the muscle, the more tension it's, it's most likely going to experience. But this is equating for proximity to failure. Okay, so remember your proximity to failure or intensity of effort is going to, is going to determine the magnitude of that mechanical tension stimulus that your muscles feel. So for example, you know, if we have Sam on one side and, and me on the other, uh, if we both take a, a bench press set to failure, momentary muscular failure, the amount of tension that Sam's chest is going to experience is probably going to be greater than mine. Um, and this is because more contractile proteins within a muscle just allows for more actin and, and myosin cross bridging. And, and that's what actually leads to, to mechanical tension. Um, now for each unit of tension stimulus that you experience, you probably also experience some fatigue. Okay. And the magnitude of that fatigue is going to rise um, as the degree of tension increases. Okay. So remember, as we get closer to failure, um, there are some caveats to this, but on average, as we get closer to failure, the amount of tension muscle experiences will increase. Okay. Um, and this means that the amount of fatigue that you experience will also increase, right? Now in a hypertrophy program, you know, most of your sets are within or should be within a close proximity to failure. Okay. And it is likely that a bigger muscle will thus require a longer recovery time because with each set, that you're, you're completing, you're probably requiring more tension, more fatigued. And if you're looking to maintain your performance to some extent, uh, you know, we definitely don't want massive performance reductions um, from set to set. You know, we want to try and maintain our, our performance um, to some extent. And if we want that to be the case, then we need sufficient rest times uh, based on, you know, the difficulty of the set. Now, what I will say on top of that as well is that as a muscle gets bigger, so as, as the muscle grows and cross-sectional area increases, its ability to produce force also increases. So we can say that it has an increased force generating capacity. And again, this comes back to what I said earlier. If we have a larger area full of contractile proteins, we have this greater ability, ability to cross bridge, right? Actin and myosin cross bridging, which leads to, to more tension, more force, and you can probably move more load. Okay, as your muscle gets, gets bigger, you're probably going to be able to move more load. That's, that's in most cases, the natural progression we see, especially in like beginner and intermediate um, individuals. So with uh, training status, that's what I'm referring to there. Uh, as we get into that advanced um, stage, things start to change a little bit. And, you know, you can build muscle without getting stronger. But in many cases, we're going to see that progression. And... The anaerobic energy demand of your sets is essentially scaled with load. So the more load you use in a set, the more metabolism uh, there's going to be occurring within those muscles. So the more anaerobic energy uh, is going to be created throughout those sets as you increase load. So I guess to, to help you conceptualize this, using an extreme example can help. So imagine, for example, Eddie Hall, um, who's this massive strong man, you know, throws tons of weights around. The amount of anaerobic energy demand, you know, within his muscles as he lifts, you know, humongous amounts of weight is going to be, you know, quite high. It's going to be, and he, he, the length of his sessions would undoubtedly be stretched um, quite significantly because the amount of rest that he would have to take in between those very demanding sets, right? So he is on, you know, that end of the spectrum. And sometimes it's just important to kind of, yeah, wrap your head around that, that concept, um, or at least that helps wrap your head around the concept. And the issue is that anaerobic demand is going to increase as load goes up, 
but your ability, your your aerobic capacity, right, doesn't, and your anaerobic capacity doesn't really uh, increase to the same extent, right? So with risk resistance training, we don't really acquire many aerobic adaptations, particularly in the the latter stages of our training career. You know, early on, maybe yes, but intermediate to advanced level, most likely not. And remember, if, if there's a greater anaerobic demand within the muscles during your sets, that is going to place a larger demand on your aerobic system, right, in between sets when you're recovering. Because when you're recovering, remember, it's the aerobic system that is doing most of that work, even resistance training. You know, we're trying to clear all those metabolites, um, you know, you're huffing, puffing, trying to get your breath back. That's the aerobic system at work. And again, with resistance training, we don't get many aerobic adaptations. Okay, so essentially what we see here is this anaerobic demand increases as your muscles get bigger and you lift more load. And aerobic capacity, just hanging around here, it doesn't really um, increase to the same extent at all. So we get this disproportionate um, adaptations to, to certain energy, energy systems, you could say. Uh, so in that case, again, you would need more rest in between sets. Right, and this is why some, you know, degree of aerobic training uh, throughout the the macro cycle should be is a good idea, and should probably be periodized into that long term plan. Uh, but that's that's a um, conversation for another day. And the last one, so there is one more thing that's just sprung to mind: uh, a bigger muscle may also have a larger capacity for muscle damage, right? To experience muscle damage. That's quite simply because it experiences more tension. So again, this is going to lead to longer recovery curves, not only in between sets, but in between sessions. Um, so just something to keep in mind there. You know, we know muscle damage can take quite some time to, to recover, um, and it can also lead to CNS fatigue, so central nervous system fatigue, due to disruption of, of certain structures within the, the muscle fibers themselves, which can lead to compromised uh, nerve signaling nerve signaling uh, from the brain to the spinal cord into the muscles and that will compromise performance. So just consideration um, for, I guess, your training frequency uh, over the week. So yeah, that is the long answer to do large muscles take longer to recover than smaller ones and why Sam takes longer rest periods than I do when we train. All right, so we'll move on nearly there. A uh, couple more questions now. Um, if a client gets injured or potentially injured during a session, how do you approach it? So this is coming from a coach. So we're speaking about face-to-face -face coaching here. And the first thing I would say, excuse me, or ask is, you know, what is an injury? And I'm not even really sure, you know, what an injury is. I'm probably not the right person to ask about that i guess like i wouldn't want to to try and define it because i wouldn't be really confident in my abilities to to define it but you know if, if you're experiencing some sort of pain in your training it doesn't necessarily classify it as an injury straight away right i think for the purpose of this question and this this discussion um let's just say that an injury disables the client from from training any in, in that session we're doing any more training whether it's leg training, upper body training, you know, they're just unable to do more because of the pain that they're experiencing. And in this case, telling a client to suck it up is probably not a good idea. You know, I've been there myself to some extent, probably didn't say it like that, but probably meant it uh, and, and said it in, in other ways. But yeah, that's not a good idea. I think listening to the client, showing, showing them your ability to kind of listen to it, you know, what they're feeling. Um, and don't brush, don't brush it off. You know, we have to understand that pain sensation can be highly individual. So what might be not painful for you might be very painful for someone else. And it's probably not a good idea to, to brush something like that off. And reassurance is, is should be taking precedence at, at that point, you know, listening and reassuring them that they will be okay because all injuries will heal over time. Um, you know, obviously, this depends on the extent of the injury, but if, if it did disable them from training any further, then you know, I'd stop the session and I'd just take the rest of the session to just kind of speak to them and get their mind off it. You know, it in many cases, it's not going to be a severe injury. 
So you're going to be able to sit down with the client and just speak to them, just have a genuine conversation, you know, get their mind of the injury. You know, if, if you understand pain signs, you would know that just the mere thought of a vulnerable muscle can instigate pain sensation. So imagine just, you know, you probably wouldn't, if that's the case, you probably wouldn't want to just be discussing the injury for the rest of the session, right? Talk about something else, get them to sit down. Um, you know, don't bring it up. You know, if, if, if the, or bring it up again, it depends on the extent of the injury. So if it's really bad, then you'd have to bring it up. But if, if, it, if you don't think it's that bad, you know, don't bother too much. Just, just tell them, give them a free session. You know, tell them that the next time they're going to come in, you know, you give them a free session and, and you'll make up for it. Um, so a few things to keep in mind there. And if the client is just feeling pain um, and they're not injured, they're just feeling, you know, something and you're not quite sure about it. You know, you, you don't really believe it. It's, it's going to be a bad injury or anything like that. Cause you know, like I said, pain since pain science is interesting. Um, and in many cases, the sensation of pain doesn't mean there's an injury. doesn't mean there's this damage to the tissue. Um, so there's no tissue trauma in some cases. And in many cases, it's a protective mechanism. So it's your brain signaling this, this sensation of pain to ensure that you don't go and do something that can actually aggravate it and actually turn it into some sort of tissue trauma. Um, so something to keep in mind there. And in that case, you know, you wouldn't want to just be asking the client, you know, if, if they feel a bit of lower back pain, you don't want to be saying, Oh, you know, how's your back? How's your back before every set? Cause you're just, again, reminding them of, of this, this vulnerability that they have. And that's probably not going to, you know, work in, in your favor. So, you know, manage the, the issue, select other exercises. And this is why you should have more than one alternative, you know, for exercises, have your progressions, your regressions. You need to be quick with this. You know, you can't just, you know, be there deciding what you're going to, what you're going to do now that the client's feeling pain, you know, for, for, for five minutes, you've got to be fast with this. You've got to be able to, to make quick decisions and move on to something else. Um, and what I will say, you know, if, if you aren't, if you if you're not sold, on it being anything major, then you should still show some empathy. And, you know, in the past, again, probably things that I you know, could have worked on throughout my career, showing more empathy in, in, in those um, cases and doing your best to kind of teach the client the importance of training, even if they're feeling some sort of pain, because we know training can be therapeutic. Okay. And sometimes, you know, I mentioned that protective mechanism that the body sometimes displays. Sometimes training can actually just help mitigate that you know, moving the body, it, it can actually be remedial to some extent. So yeah, usually trying to uh, address it as well can do wonders. So like, even though you're not, you're not sure it's a natural thing, just trying to address it, showing the client some empathy, and then actually showing them that you're trying to help fix the issue. You know, psychologically, that can also help. And you, we can't underestimate the power of psychology in this case. You know, pick a mobility exercise that is relevant to the, to the to the issue at hand and take the client through it and, you know, just show them that you actually care and that you're trying to do something about it as opposed to saying, Oh, nah, you know, it, it's probably just uh, a protective thing. You know, your brain's just sending this, this pain sensation out to your hamstring and it's not even an injury. It's not, it's not even pain. It's not real pain. You know, you don't want to be that type of coach. Um, I think over time teaching the client about pain signs is important and may be beneficial in the long run. But, you know, don't just bring it up as soon as, as the injury occurs. Um, so just something to keep in mind. Uh, and, yeah, maybe you should leave, you know, that education side of things, the pain science stuff, till, you know, the end of the session or, you know, in subsequent sessions, you might bring it up and, and teach the client about it. But first, you should probably try and get over that, that initial hill. Um, so hope that makes sense. Uh, we'll move on. One more question for today. And this question is about deloading. So when do I know that I'll be needing a deload? And this is a tough question to answer with minimal context. This would depend on your uh, training phase focus. You know, are you training for strength, hypertrophy? You know, what, what, are, you, what are you doing? I, I might tackle this from a muscle hypertrophy perspective because that's my thing. So I guess the reason we deload for muscle hypertrophy is to kind of preserve our ability to, to progressively overload our training. So remember, we need to see this increase in that mechanical tension stimulus over time to keep pace with the adaptations that we're acquiring from previous sessions. And if we're not progressively overloading our training, well, 
and, and the stimulus that we're acquiring from each session isn't within that, that range that we need to kind of be floating within over time. You know, if we're, if we're down here and we're just not able to push things up higher, well, the productiveness of our sessions is probably going to be quite low from a, from a muscle building perspective. And usually the reason you, you struggle to, to overload your training is probably fatigue, right? Fatigue starts to, to diminish your ability to perform. And we need to be able to perform if we want to overload our training. So something to, to keep in mind there, that's, that's, that's on a basic level, that's, that's why we deload. Um, so I'll just spit out a few basic considerations um, for when, yeah, in, like for deload in indications, I guess. Um, the first one would be performance decreases. You know, if you're seeing major decreases in, in performance, and you've plateaued for more than, than two weeks. Let's say you, you've, you know, one week, not sure if we can say we need a deload as of yet, but if you've plateaued for two weeks, if you are unable to, to progressively overload your training to some extent, um, then you most likely need a deload, okay? And then on the flip side, you know, if we, if we see your performance actually going down and you're regressing, well, again, we probably need a deload. Right now, if you drop a, a rep, on one set or two sets, that's not the end of the world. But if you're seeing massive decreases in, in, in performance that are consistent from session to session, well, that's something that you, you're going to need to address with a deload. Now remember hypertrophy is not a performance adaptation. So if you do happen to drop a rep or two, as long as you're, pro you're meeting that proximity to failure, you're probably still going to be getting an effective mechanical tension stimulus that will promote growth. But yeah, we need to, we need to be careful because if we do kind of sense these performance decrements accumulating over time, um, then that probably indicates increases in fatigue and we need to deload. Um, on top of that, general fatigue throughout the day is something else that you should probably keep an eye out for. Um, if you're feeling lethargic throughout the day, if you are walking into your sessions feeling a bit motivated, uh, you know, remote training motivation is low. Um, if you're struggling to sleep sometimes as well, you know, if like if you really get into the point where training is getting really hard, uh, you know, close to the end of the program, a few things can occur that will essentially start to compromise like your just general quality to life, like your general day to day things. Like I mentioned, you know, motivation, sleep, et cetera, might even start feeling a little under the weather uh, in, in some cases as well. So a few things to kind of keep in, keep in mind there. Um, when, when it comes to resistance training, those sorts of things probably aren't very prevalent. They are probably more prevalent in other sorts of, of um, training endeavors uh, that require a larger work demand. Um, you know, tri triathletes, et cetera, would probably experience that more than just pure resistance training folks. So something to keep in mind. Um, and a few other ones. So, you know, if you're not recovering between sessions, uh, if you're pulling up to, you know, you train chest on Monday, you train chest again on Thursday, you pull up on that, that Thursday session and you're really sore, well, that's probably an indication that you need some sort of a deload. And especially if this is happening consistently with other muscle groups as well. Um, and even, you know, minus the soreness, if you're walking into that session and off the bat, you know, the bar feels heavier, heavier in your hand, in your arms or on your back, um, or your bar speed is slow, or we could just say repetition speed. You know, if your repetition speed is abnormally slow in the onset, in the early stages of your session, well, again, that's probably an indication that fatigue dissipation is required, uh, which means we need a dealer. Um, now, again, I probably can't jump, get too deep into this topic for this question and answer, but to, to maximize, maximize muscle hypertrophy, you, know, you do have to train under fatigued conditions at some point especially towards the end of a mesocycle. And sometimes, you know, repetition speed will be slow. Okay. But there's actually research that shows, you know, slow repetition speeds are actually uh, beneficial for hypertrophy. And, and we, that's, that's where we kind of have to um, think a little more critically about the situation and not just call the D load lot just like that. And this is where this is, this essentially exemplifies the importance of having numerous kind of indicators that you use to um, establish whether or not you need a deload. And if they're all kind of pointing in the same direction at the same time, then yeah, 
you know, a deload is probably going to be warranted. But if only one is pointing in that direction and the others aren't, again, you have to, you have to think critically. So keep that in mind. And I would also say, you know, if you've been training hard, you've been progressively overloading your training for more than six or so weeks. Um, and, you know, hypertrophy training should be close to failure. I mean, in, in most of your sets, you should be, you know, getting pretty close to failure and thus it's fatiguing in nature. Um, over six weeks, yeah, I, I would suspect that a deload would be um, warranted uh, in, in the near future beyond that that six week mark. So just, just something to keep in mind based off my experience. That's essentially what I've um, gauged, but that could be also be just a byproduct of, of the way I, I program. Um, so another consideration, uh, you know, it really does depend on, on how aggressive your progressions are throughout the mesocycle. Um, you know, that's going to determine how much fatigue you're acquiring. Um, and that will then determine, you know, how frequently you need to deload. Um, so hope that helps. I think I'll leave that one there. Definitely a few more things that, that we could touch on. Um, but this is why, you know, I, I said earlier, if you have follow-up questions, send them through, you know, if, if something sparks your, your attention there, uh, you want to know more about it, send it through and we can, we can tackle it uh, a little harder in the, in the next question and answer. Um, so yeah, these question and answers are they're quite super superficial in nature. There's only so much we can cover. Um, Sweet. So that is it for today. Those were all the questions um, covered. So like I said, any follow-up questions would be appreciated. And I hope that all made sense. That's it for now. And I'll see you guys soon.